Well, we've inducted a lot of football players in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame through the years. We've inducted, if you look back at the history of it, some tremendous offensive linemen. We've never inducted a wampus cat. But today, we start that process. And, uh, you know, Kevin knew Natchitoches before he knew he had a permanent home in Natchitoches. And uh, he's got a brother who graduated here from Northwestern. And now he's getting more acquainted with Natchitoches again. And uh, he's always part of the Hall of Fame family now. But he not only, as you know, was a great player at LSU, 16 NFL seasons, eight Pro Bowls, and <coughs> was one of the most respected players on the field and clearly off the field, too, because he evolved into the leader of the NFL Players Association. And when it finally pushed, came to shove, and the work stoppage happened, gave him a why was right there, being sure the players got the best possible treatment, but also trying to bring an end to that. And a couple of the things you'll see tomorrow in the museum attest to his role in that process and are very impressive. Kevin Mawai may be headed to Kenton, but right now it's Natchitoches, and we're very proud to have Kevin Mawai from Leesville and LSU. It never gets old, um, the cheers and the claps and things like that, but it is such a great privilege and an honor to be here. Um, growing up right down the road, military brat at Fort Polk and, and uh, uh, Leesville Wampus Cat. Um, such an honor, uh, Wampus Cat. Those of you from Central Louisiana know who we are. Those of you who don't, <laughs> you're probably glad you never met one of us. But, uh, you know, I don't even know what to say. It's just thank you for those who voted me in. Um, for whoever, I, mean, I don't even know the process, but I know it is a, a privilege and honor. Like Tommy said, um, the number of people that don't get in is, is almost as impressive, or if not more so impressive, than the ones of those who do get in. And, and the class to come in with, uh, uh, an LSU classmate of mine with, with Shaq, we came in at LSU at the same time. Um, and Tommy, and he probably doesn't know this, was a, a great reason for me going to LSU. I was at the game as a recruit, and I was more excited about Eddie, Eddie catching the touchdown pass than I was about the throw itself. But, uh, <laughs> but that, that day, like moments after that catch, I knew I was going to become an LSU Tiger. And uh, sealed my fate. And um, along the way, I met my incredible wife. We've been married 20 years now. And uh, she's been along for every step of the way. My kids have uh, stood the test of time as a professional athlete's child. And um, they're, uh, they made it out OK. Or, continuing to. My son's 16 and my daughter's 13. She's at summer camp. And, uh, but I'm um, just thankful to be here. It's an honor and a privilege. And uh, I've been at the Super Fresh where you worked. And we, you left the UNO when I got to LSU, but uh, I got double coupons there. So, <laughs> but uh, it was double coupon day. When you live in a married student house, and you go super fresh with double coupon days in Baton Rouge, and, uh, and that's where we went. So uh, there's, there's some ties throughout all of this. And, uh, um, but it is such a great privilege to go in with, with guys like, I've never watched horse racing before. I, I went to one race, and just amazing the athletes that you guys are, and um, even auto racing. I saw a guy hold a 45-pound plate up for two hours straight, and never moving, just because that's what he does for a living. And um, I've been to the basketball games. We were in Seattle at the same time. You never gave me tickets, but uh, that's all right. Um, you probably didn't come to our games either. We sucked in Seattle, but. Uh, but um, anyways, I can go on. I, look, I'm not afraid of the microphone or the cameras, but uh, um, questions. So we'll just so go. When did you know you were a pretty good football player? I always thought I was a pretty good football player. <laughs> uh, there's no lack of confidence either. But um, no, you know, I, it never really dawned on me where I would go. Um, I had a dream of playing in the NFL. I was eight years old. I, I lived in Hanau, Germany. My dad was stationed there, and that's where I started playing football. And I knew the day I stepped foot on the field for the first time that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, it's a dream, and uh, it, was, it was a dream that your parents always say, hey, if you work hard enough, it can happen. I'm a testament to that. Um, a couple years later, I ended up at Fort Polk, Louisiana, played for the Leesville Junior High School, and I got to dress and, and letter as a freshman for the varsity team. And, um, and I 
you know, you, you, have, you always have to wait your time. As a freshman, I, I, I traveled the varsity, I played JV, and I remember distinctly, um, James Williams was the JV coach, junior varsity coach. We actually played the Natchitoches Central Junior High School here in Natchitoches, and he brought me on the trip for that game. And it was third quarter, and I still hadn't gotten in the game. And, I, you know, and I'm complaining on the sidelines, that so you bring me all the way up here, and I don't even get to step foot on the field. This is stupid. I, you know, and basically, it was like, if you're going to bring me, put me on the field, because I didn't come here to waste my time. And, and Coach Williams told me to shut my mouth. I'd be walking back to Leesville. But, um, but I knew then that that would be the last time I stepped foot on the bus and not stepped foot on the field. And, um, and that was kind of what I wanted. Um, Eventually, I had some teammates go on to play college ball. Eddie Fuller was a fresh, a senior when I was a freshman, so I started following LSU naturally. Steve Gunn played at USL. Um, Jeff um, Jeff Steele ended up playing at U, uh, ULM, which was uh, you know Northeast at the time. So we st we were a football factory of some sorts, and so I got more interested. And and then Raymond Smoot went to LSU and Vincent Fuller the year before I did, and that's when I started getting in the recruiting process, and and. I liked LSU, and I knew about it because of my teammates, but I, I grew up in Germany watching the Big Ten football, Michigan, Ohio State, and, and Alabama was always on. So Alabama was a big team. They didn't recruit me. And, but man, I went to the LSU game and, and the earthquake game, and, and my former teammate caught the touchdown that, that shook the earth, and, and it was amazing. And I was like, wow. And, um, and so I had the opportunity to come. And, but I, I knew probably by the end of my sophomore year that I would have a chance to get to the NFL, uh, to get to the college. And it wasn't until probably my second or third, maybe my third year in college that it really dawned on me that I had a true chance of, of getting to the NFL. I had a coach, Kenny Farrow, who has been in the papers, who was probably the first coach that ever said to me that you have what it takes to play at the next level. And um, that meant the world to me. And um, who would have known 20 something years later that I, you know, I've been inducted to LSU's Hall of Fame as is Tommy and, and Shaq, and um, you know, and, and now this one I finally got into Leesville's Hall of Fame. Well, they just started it last year, so I was the first guy. But uh, um, and you know, and, and Tommy, thank you for the kind words. Um, you know, last summer I was able to go watch my teammate Curtis Martin be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and, and I hold that building. And reverence because it is it's the epitome and um, I don't think any athlete ever goes into the game or into the sport playing and saying I'm gonna be a Hall of Famer they just go and play and they just love the game and, and that's all I did I just loved the game and and the good stuff came with it and um, I played hard because I loved it if I was gonna play I wanted to be the best and when you play with that attitude then the other stuff comes behind it. You don't say, I'm going to be the best and then go work. You just go work and don't say anything. Just keep your mouth shut and go work. And, and people recognize it. And um, for me, that's kind of what happened. Kevin, what kind of the most influential for you? Was it the environment playing with the game? The most, you know, I played for now, one, two, three, four, five really good coaches. I came in the league under Tom Flores in Seattle, and I played for Dennis Erickson. Bill Parcells brought me to New York, and I played for Al Grove for one year, um, Herm Edwards for five, and then and then you know Jeff Fisher. But out of all the coaches that that I believe was the best coach in the NFL I ever played for was Bill Parcells. Um, it, it was funny, so it, that's another thing Tommy and I have in common. Bill went there when Tommy left, and then I got to New York, and I ended up playing for Bill. And, and Bill was the coach when I got drafted, I said I would never play in New York, and I would never play for that guy. And um, it's because I saw what he did in New England, and, and all I saw was like the cussing and the yelling and the screaming. And I had three years of that at college. I'm, I'm done with that. I don't need that anymore. And, um, but it turned out it was the best decision I ever made to go play for the man. He was the best coach from A to Z that I've ever played for as far as knowing where to go, who to do it, how to do it, who's going to do it, and how to get that person to do it. And um, I always tell people if there's 85 guys on the roster, he knows how to push all 85 different buttons in a different way. Um, and so that was, it was pretty neat to play for him, to see him mastermind that kind of stuff. And if I wanted to know what kind of Xerox toner I need to put in the machine, he was probably the guy who would be able to tell me because he knew everything about it. And um, 
but he, he he's another special coach that, that I played for. When Parcells tells you that you're one of the best that's ever played for him, that means something. And, uh, and he shared that with me several years ago. And and um, I'm happy for him getting to go in the Hall of Fame this year. Herm Edwards was awesome. I loved playing for him. Uh, the, the play to win the game speech was awesome. We were 0-6. And um, the, the media thought we'd just shut it down. We ended up making the playoffs that year. But, um, but, but by far, Parcells is one who probably, you know, he's the one who took a chance on me. You know, he made me the highest paid center in the history of the league. Everybody thought he was crazy for doing it. And um, I made good on the promise. I said, if I come here, I will be your next Pro Bowl offensive lineman. And I was. Who's the toughest defensive lineman or some of them? The, the, there's two guys that stand out for me in my career, 16 years, the two toughest guys I ever played against, and, and I never hesitate, is Junior Seau and John Randall. Junior Seau, I caught him, he was in year four, five, six, the prime of his career when I was a young pup starting out in Seattle. And I, re I recall the game vividly, we were playing against Seattle, I mean, playing against uh, San Diego at home in Seattle, and um, I couldn't put my hands on him. Could not put my hands on him. It didn't matter what I did, whether I climbed him as a linebacker or whether he blitzed a gap or whatever. Every time I went to hit something, I was hitting air. And it was so bad at halftime, this is in 97, that I sat in the locker room at halftime crying. And, and I literally, I was crying. And then Warren Moon's my quarterback, and I'm on the bench begging Warren, please forgive me, I'm so sorry. I said, this guy's just killing me. And um, I sat in the locker room after the game. Everybody's getting dressed. We lost the game. And I, my back is to the team. And I'm in the locker room just crying because I, I felt I played that bad against him. And uh, I remember my old line coach, Howard Mudd, walked outside. And my wife, Tracy, asked him. So he, he didn't play very well, did he? And Howard Mudd was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as it turns out, the film is never as bad as you think it is. It's never as good as you think it is. But as it turned, you know, I, I played okay against him. But um, but he was but the best linebacker I've ever played against. And then John Randall was the guy. Your pass protection was dictated by where John Randall was. It's a uh, you know it's two jet whatever. But you're supposed to slide left. Well, John Randall's to the right. Hey, we're blowing it. We're going to slide right. You know we're going base because John Randall's in the middle. We're going to slide left because that's where John Randall is. John Randall pass protection. And uh, the guy had a motor that that wouldn't stop. He just stopped. He just kept going and kept going, and, and he ran a mouth that went with the, the actions, and he just got tired. But um, but hands down, those are the two guys that I think, in my opinion, were the best that I've ever played against. As president of the Players Association, what was your greatest accomplishment? The greatest accomplishment I had as president president of the Players Association was the 2011 CBA. Um, a lot of our fans and a lot of the media would recognize those last six months of negotiations that took us to the deal in June, July of 2011. But what they didn't see was the three years leading up to it. Um, you know, there were some tumultuous times within the organization, um, leadership changes with Gene Upshaw passing away. I took over as a president during that time, had a very highly controversial search for a new executive director. And so that started the process and the negotiations and then trying to unite the players in such a way that when we did get not locked out, that guys wouldn't step over the line or would, would take backdoor deals to get the deal done. Um, it happened in, in the past with the NFL and how they split the players in the locker room. It's happened in the NBA and NHL and Major League Baseball, how management will divide the forces. But somehow, some way, we figured out a way in 2010 to pull our players together and bring the biggest names on the rosters on our side and make sure they stayed on our side. And so when we finished that deal in 2011, it was the biggest monkey off my back ever. Um, and I always told the guys as the president of the PA that when I stood in front of them, if I never got another benefit, if I never got another bonus for our players or anything else, but the only thing we got was a fair deal for the next 10 or 12 years, then that would be the greatest legacy I would ever leave as a football player, aside from being on the field. And I did that. And um, it's the one thing I'm most proud of. How did you get into being a player rep? How did that evolve? How did I get to become a player rep? Well, it started back in Leesville when I was on this campus for student council con conventions. And uh, I served as a student council member in high school. We'd come to Northwestern for their, our you know, association meetings and stuff like that. But um, you know, as a rookie, I really didn't pay much attention to the, to the Players Association Union. I thought it was just it was a, a, a 
dig more money out of your pocket kind of an organization. Um, the older players who went through the 87 strike and then and then the play plan B, Reggie, Reggie White lawsuit, those guys were in our locker room and those guys had a very sour taste towards the union and so I just kind of went along with them and really didn't care about it. Just give me my check at the end of the, the meeting and I'll be on my way. But I always kept track of what was going on. So in, in 98, when I went to the, the New York Jets, um, Keyshawn Johnson sat in front of me. And though I didn't really get involved with the union, I always kept up with the issues of the union. So when Keyshawn would ask me a question, I, I had the answer for him, or I knew where to get the answer or whatever. So he's like, well, you need to be our team rep. I was like, whatever, you know. So in 98, that season, he nominated me. I got elected as a team rep. And so that was my first first time as a, as a team rep. I served as a team rep for, I want to say, four years, maybe six, something like that. And then um, four years. And in 2002, some spaces opened up on executive committee. A former teammate of mine who played in Seattle, Eugene Robinson, was retiring. And he nominated me as a, as a vice president. I got elected there served there for four years and um and then 2008 i actually went back to our meetings with the idea to tell my executive committee that i would step away from the union i had eight years run working going through two or three negotiations and, uh, and extensions of the cba and i was just ready to stop the travel and the meetings and whatever and and things transpired during that meeting that i just felt in my gut and in my spirit that it wasn't right and that somebody needed to take over before this thing went downhill pretty fast. And so I ran for president that year um, in spite of, of being the, the, the underdog and, and votes were already counted that I wouldn't win the election and, and I got elected. And because um, there was for me, it was never about me. It was always about serving the guys. And um, I, I truly believe that leaders who serve others are the ones that come out on top instead of those who serve themselves. And um, fortunately for me, it worked out that way. Do I have a high opinion? You know what? Here's the deal about Commissioner. He's got a, no, I can answer that, the question honestly. Um, Commissioner Goodell has one of the toughest jobs in professional sports. Um, he's got overpaid players, uh, not overpaid, <laughs> that's not the words out of my mouth, <laughs> highly paid players um, who sometimes make very silly decisions. And, but he also works for highly paid individuals in the team owners. Um, he's got to please 32 owners, but he's got to make it right for the 2,000 players and the former players who played the game. So I don't envy his job at all. If he was a guy that I just met on the street, I would sit down and bar, you know, in, in a restaurant, have a meal with him, buy him a beer or something like that. But, um, but he's on that side and I'm on this side. And that's something that, that the fans a lot of times don't understand that in the professional sports world, there's management and then there's players. And you guys that are athletes and players understand that. And when it comes time to make a decision, it's not about Kevin Y played for us for eight years and he's such a great guy. It's like, who can I get that's just as good, if not better than him, for a whole lot cheaper price? And, um, but commissioner, commissioner has a tough job. He has, to, he has to appease 32 billionaire owners, all the while making sure 2,000 millionaire players aren't making foolish mistakes. And uh, there's examples all over the place. The unfortunate part is there's 10 guys every year that make 2,000 guys look like idiots. And, um, and that's the biggest problem he has to deal with. You know this. You know, this is not the forum to talk about Aaron Hernandez or any of those guys that make decisions. Uh, look, there's, there's, the NFL is a microcosm of society in general, and and the things that you hear about NFL players doing, there or NBA players or Major League Baseball players, there are people in our hometowns who are doing the exact same things that you never hear about. The thing is, you don't know about it because they don't make five million dollars a year. Um, all I can say in that situation is I pray for the family of the young man who was killed. I pray that, uh, that the truth will come out and however it comes out. And, um, and for the young guys that are coming in the game, be smart, man. Know who you're with, uh, know where you're going. And, if, and like Parcells always told us, if you, if you don't go where you're not known or where you're not wanted, because that's when you get in trouble. And Herm Edwards always said that nothing good happens after midnight. 
And uh, so that's the truth. And, and for the young guys that aren't married, the girls get uglier after 2 a.m. <laughs> you know, it's just it's the truth. And um, but it's just an unfortunate situation. And um, I just pray for all those involved. And I just hope things turn out right for everybody that 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 it happens to. So. Uh, the concussion player safety. Uh, the last couple of years. Yeah. Yep. What's your opinion on all that? I mean, did you see that big kind of a problem? You know, the, the, here's the, the and then this goes back to the CBA question. The, the biggest issue for the players in the, during the CBA was not about getting more dollars in their pockets. It was about the long-term wealth, health, and welfare of our players. Mm -hmm. And how does what we did for a living affect our long-term lifestyles? And, and so now concussion, the whole concussion thing is such a big forefront issue. It, it's not that it hasn't ever been, but it's just there's more science and more technology behind it to support what everybody thought was a problem to begin with. And um, so the, they have, there's a class action lawsuit going on right now with all the NFL players. You know, I'm not a part of that lawsuit, um, but there, look, you're going to get hurt playing professional sports. It happens. You're going to get your head wrong. You're going to get concussion. It's part of the game. Um, the part that's disturbing is that there were studies done back in the mid 80s in the early 90s that showed that those concussions cause issues, but they were swept under the rug or we were told as players that that, that was not in fact the case. And so that's where the biggest issue is. The, the greatest stride we did this coming in forward in 2011 was understanding all that issues, knowing that for the future here on forward that we won't have those issues because now we got new science to back up what the players wanted. We've cut out two-a-days for any guy that plays football. And Tommy, you would have loved us back in the day because you'll never play two. There's no, no such thing as two-a-days in the NFL anymore. Um, there's only 14 padded practices throughout the entire 16-week season. That means full pads, helmets, and shoulder pads. Um, so when you reduce the number of incidences where a player can have concussive episodes, then you obviously will reduce the amount of opportunities for him to get a concussion. And so we're trying to do things for the first time we have practice uh, regulations on, on the number of practices and how long you can go and, and what constituted two-a-day practice. And, and there's what we had to actually define a walkthrough practice versus a shoulder pad practice and, and go through those steps because a walkthrough practice for Bill Parcells is not the same as a walkthrough practice was for Al Groh. You know, it's just one of those deals. But, um, but it's, you, we're going to continue to see that. And I think the biggest thing that the NFL in general has done was that we've set the standard for the lower, the lower levels. The NCAA has changed their rules because of what the NFL did. And then, then high school has changed their rules. And so Pop Warner has changed their rules with USA football and teaching how to you know, hit and tackle and things like that. So, and the one thing I am proud about the NFL and the conjoined effort between the two is that, that we understand that we set the tempo for, for youth sports in America when it comes to football. And, um, and so we found a way to come together to be able to make the game safer for the future generations that come after us. All right, last question, and I, I have to point out as an active guy, one of the proponents, leading uh, spokespeople for concussions is Julian Bales, a doctor who grew up in that, <coughs> now she graduated, by the way. Uh, but you talked about the guy's toughest to block. You talked about the best coach. And we briefly touched on some other folks in the NFL. But you probably played with a few characters, too. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I've had some great guys that I've played with. Um, it, it started at LSU. Um, I'm still dear friends with Ross Sutters and Chad Loop and, and, um, and a few other guys that will be here this coming weekend. And um, the only stories we have to tell about are about the time, the three-year period where we were one of the worst teams in LSU's history. So uh, anyway, I appreciate you guys kind of glossing over all that. But, uh, but it, it, when you're around LSU football, it, our generation of players or my, my age group, all we can do is have a gripe session about the time we played under Curly Holman. And, um, but in Seattle, we, I played with a teammate, uh, James Atkins, is actually from A. Meet, Louisiana, um, played at USL. And the, the guy just had stories about him and his granddaddy going across the, the, the river down the bridge and the, you know, you know, the roof flying up and the chickens flying off the truck and things like that to, to just stuff that happens in the locker room. And let me just say, what happens in the locker room stays in the locker room. Um, the idea to have cameras in the locker room now is the best idiotic thing I've ever heard of. 
But um, James Atkins was definitely a character. Loved playing with that guy. Um, Curtis Martin, um, not a character, but he's so quiet you ever really wondered if he was alive <laughs> until game day. Um, he's still aloof to these days. He got married and had kids, and nobody ever knew about it. Um, he, he did. He did. Then I uh, got to the Hall of Fame, and all of a sudden, hey, this is my wife and my daughter. I was like, wow, you got married? Really? Um, so some of these guys would be here. Some of my LSU guys and, and uh, a couple of NFL players would be here tomorrow. Um, gosh, there's just too many. There's too many guys to think about. Some of the greatest players I've played with. Um, but the stories that I could tell stay in the locker room. So, what are you doing today? What am I doing today? Uh, my brother was interviewed by KLB in Alexandria, and they asked him the same question yesterday, and he laughed on camera. Oh. So, <laughs> if that tells you anything, um, no, I am I am permanently retired. Um, I live in Baton Rouge. My wife and I and my kids we moved back home to Baton Rouge um, this last July, and and I'm doing absolutely nothing. I spend time with my kids. I. I Tommy has informed me that I'm well seen in our neighborhood where we take the kids to school. And uh, I don't know if I'm driving fast or just because I got a big truck. But um, I take my kids to school. I take my kids to school. I have lunch with my wife every day. And uh, I get to mow my own grass. Uh, some of y'all might laugh and think that's the worst chore in the world for me. To try paying somebody to do that for 16 years. It adds up after a while. But it's one of the things I enjoy the most. I sit on my mower for three hours every couple weeks. and cut grass, I go to swim meets and dance competitions. My son's actually competing in the, the National Cha Irish Dance Championships in Anaheim next week, so we're leaving here to go there for that. And um, both my kids are, are swimmers, so I spend many days at the swimming pool. Were you a swimmer? <laughs> Liesl didn't even have a swimming pool. <laughs> so, no, I was a football player. So that's what I'm doing. So I, I do speak on side. I, I speak for FCA and, and for church groups and things like that. Um, I'm up for hire. So if anybody needs a men's retreat or a church retreat, I'm, I'm more than available. Um, I can, we can talk about the fee later. <laughs> but that's what I do. I just try to share my passion for my family and share my passion for the church and, uh, and, and uh, for what God's done in my life. And um, you know, going on a missions trip in September. If anybody wants to go to Zimbabwe and, and Africa, check it out, children, childrenscup.org. I'm um, taking a group of business leaders there to try to show them what, uh, what they can do with their finances and their resources. So uh, that's what I'm doing these days. Thank you guys very much. For Give